Our presenter again is David Lair, Senior Tech Support Engineer and Trainer with SCC. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to David. Thank you, Aaron. My name is David Lair, and I do technical support and training classes, primarily here at the SCC's Elk Grove Village Training Center. However, over the past 15 years, I've also visited many of you for training at your company and many other locations as well. Tech support can be reached, uh, our offices can be reached for tech support between 6.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. Chicago time. And SCC has a very extensive website at sccombustion.com and I highly recommend it for product information, sales customer support, and a wealth of technical information. The LMV5 technical instructions can be downloaded here from the SCC website or ordered free of charge by contacting a sales rep or customer service. Some of you may have been mailed this for today. Section and page references in this presentation refer to this document. This is the fourth in a seven part series of seminars on the LMV5. Today, we're gonna to cover 104 troubleshooting. Future ones are shown on the screen. Section seven covers troubleshooting. The last 37 pages list all of the fault codes in order by fault number. The LMV5 gives lots and lots of information on all faults, detailing phase, start number, loads, et cetera. Let's take a look at a typical fault process. When the LMV goes into a fault, the AZL screen will display a lockout and it will toggle between the lockout and a plain English fault condition, such as air pressure off, back and forth between lockout, air pressure off, telling you what the fault condition is. On the AZL display, if you press escape, you can go back to operational stat, normal operation, and then when you go to try and enter normal operation, it says you can't because you have a lockout and you must reset via the operational stat status reset screen, specifically telling us how to go about resolving the fault and resetting it. So from that screen, from operational stat, we escape, go back to operational stat, enter operational stat, just like the screen told us. In this case, we go to status reset versus normal operation and press enter on status reset. Now the screen toggles between the plain English air pressure off and a much more detailed diagnostic display, giving us loads of information on the exact error at the current, at the current uh, time. We can then perform a soft reset. A soft reset, as that screen is toggling back and forth from either of the two diagnostic screens, we can simply escape the diagnostic screen. Since we have seen the fault in detail, we have acknowledged it, and then we'll be prompted if we'd like to reset the fault with enter. At this point, if you hit enter, reset is displayed on the screen and the fault is cleared. The alternative is to do a hard reset from any screen, any screen. You can press an external reset button for one or two seconds and release and the fault is reset on the screen and the fault is cleared. Let's take a closer look at that reset circuit. This is a good time to discuss this. Reset wiring. First, notice that the input is marked remote reset and lockout. And that's because that's exactly what the function of that input is. If you are in a lockout and you push this button, you take line voltage and you present it to X401.1, and this causes the LMV to do a reset. However, once the fault is removed, if you apply power to this terminal again, you will in fact cause a manual lockout. This has caused a lot of confusion with the customers. 
I get tech support calls saying, I keep pushing the reset button, I keep getting faults, it won't go away. It's because they're causing the fault by applying power to a non-faulted LMV and they're simply not waiting for the prompts. The fix for this is to source the power from the alarm output instead of line voltage. So remove the connection from line voltage, locate the alarm circuit, which would be X301.2 that normally rings the alarm bell, and you continue to do that, and simply connect the reset button to that source of power. Now, when you get an alarm and you push the reset button, you will in fact cause a reset. However, once the alarm is cleared, the voltage on X301.2 is deactivated and pushing the button will not cause subsequent manual lockout faults. This has proven time and time again to be a much better approach to wiring the reset switch versus a line voltage connection. Once you clear that fault, you can always go back and view it in the fault history. Or if in fact the fault has caused an actual lockout, then you can see it in the lockout history as well. And that will have date and time details specifically of when the fault occurred. When you go back to the fault history and you look at it, the fault screen is going to toggle again from the plain English display and to a much more detailed diagnostic display. Pressing enter will halt the screen on either of the two toggles when it goes back and forth from air pressure off to the code to air pressure off. As soon as you hit enter, you can halt it on either screen so that you can work on the unit. Fault detail offers the screen offers a lot of information. Class. This is another example of the LMV5's global use. Europe, specifically England, requires a class for any fault. The higher the number, the more severe the fault. Fuel. In this case, gas was selected when this fault occurred. And since the LMV5 can be dual fuel, this is a good place to start knowing that it was a gas. Code. Now you're talking my language. I do tech support. This code versus the simple language display gives you a much, much more detail of the exact fault that occurred. Diagnostic. Now we even get into fine tuning much more detail on any specific fault. You can get an air pressure fault and the, de the code will, I mean, the diagnostic will then tell you if the air pressure was on or off and much more detail on specifically on many of the faults to fine tune the exact nature of the fault. Phase is very telling. In this case, air pressure off, code 28, if it was phase 30, we'd have been in full purge. That clearly means that the air pressure switch was not connected in any fashion and never makes even when we're in full purge. However, if we had a fault when it went to phase 36, then we know that the air pressure switch would have failed when the air damper was driving down to ignition position. That would simply mean that the air pressure setting needs to be adjusted to maintain the air pressure switch, even when the airflow is reduced for the ignition light off. And then we also get a load indication, so we know what load or firing rate the burner was at when the issue occurred. This also helps us diagnose the problem. Let's go into some troubleshooting. We'll take that exact fault we had right there. We'll start with section seven, troubleshooting. First thing we do is we look up the code. In this case, code 28. The next column in fact tells us that this is an air pressure fault, meaning specifically that the air pressure was off when it should have been on. And then we get a corrective action followed by some information on how to correct the condition. Now we can proceed to section two on the wiring. And page 31, we see that the air pressure is controlled by the terminal X302.1. 
Now we know exactly where to meter to check for voltage to see if the air pressure switch is making or not. We also know that the program, that the terminal is programmable. The function will be air pressure switch. And we know the parameters that control this terminal, such as in this case, two parameters, air pressure test and fan runup time. Air pressure test will activate or deactivate the input. Fan runup time will set the amount of time we get to make the air pressure once the fan is started. Also in the wiring section, since we know that this is an input, could simply look at the ladder diagrams and get a better understanding. We go to the 120 volt input, section two, page 16. We see that the combustion air pressure switch is in fact connected to X302.1, and that is controlled by the parameters, air pressure test and fan runup time. All through the tech support manual, we constantly tell you the terminal number, the function, air pressure test, and the related parameters. This is covered in the wiring, in the wiring chart, in the parameter programming, in the diagnostic and troubleshooting. All these go together. Now we know X321 is used and the parameters that are involved in diagnosing the fault. If we look at section three parameters, since we know that the parameter name is called air pressure test, the index tells us to go to page 12. When we go to page 12, now we have a menu path. Now we can simply go to the AZL, say parameter display, burner control, configuration, configure input output, and we see the air pressure test parameter displayed. The O on here tells us that we have to be logged in at the OEM level in order to access this parameter. The range gives us our options on setting this, activate, deactivate, deactivate, and standby, and a description giving us a complete description on how those parameters work. Let's take another example of another fault, fault feedback AUX1. If we go to section troubleshooting on page 40, we will see, in fact, a code 84 it is a fault feedback on the auxiliary one actuator. Since we don't know where exactly in the menu to go on this, the first two pages of the parameter section give you the detail of all 300 parameters on the LMV. If you're not sure about exactly which parameters involved, go to the next page and there's a subjective listing by topic. In this case, we'll go to actuators and we see that the activation is on page 20. When we go to 20, we see we can navigate to parameter display, ratio control, gas settings, go to the auxiliary and we can activate or deactivate that auxiliary actuator if in fact we have it or don't have it. This will help us diagnose what the problems are. Let's take another one, short circuit PT100. Again, we look at the code, A6. We look at page 45 in the troubleshooting section. A6 says it's an open short circuit on a PT100. You notice we have the diagnostic code, phase 52, tells us exactly what the code is. In this case, the troubleshooting section also gave us the terminal number and the parameter involved, most likely, which is sensor select. So we go to sensor select in the parameter section. We see that it's on page 33. We go to page 33. We dial up parameters and display, load control, configuration, go down to sensor select and set the proper sensor. In this case, if we had been using a pressure sensor and it was set to a PT100, that would have been why we had the fault. We can also go to section two wiring and since it told us that the terminal was X60, we see how to properly wire a temperature sensor to X60 if in fact that's what we're using and what parameters are involved to set it up correctly, which would all be listed on the right. Additional sensor, air temper X60, FGR, measurement range, including sensor select or variable PTNI and get it configured and get the terminals tested and make sure what, exactly what the problem is. Let's take another common fault that we see, which is AZL not on bus. 
this is probably the strongest fault you can get on the LM5 system. What it's telling you is that the CAN bus network is no longer communicating. And I can't tell you what the fault is because there's no communication going on whatsoever. So let's take a look at the CAN bus system. We're gonna, of course, need the LMV5 basic unit and then an AZL display for the human interface. The AZL is connected to the LMV5 by means of a CAN bus connection. In order to run the burner, we're gonna need some actuators for air, gas, fuel, whatever our particular job is using. And those must also be daisy chain connected by CAN bus connections. So this is the CAN bus communication network shown in purple between the servos, the LMV, and the AZL display unit. Along with the CAN bus system communication, we have the power. That's an integral part of the CAN bus system as well. We start with the power on X304 on the bottom, go to the transformer, and bring back power to X10 to power the LMV5 and to power the two 12 volt AC connections going to the AZL and the servos. Notice on the right in red are the location of the fuses. So if we don't have the proper power, we can always go and check the fuses and see if in fact we have a blown fuse. On the upper left in red also is a good place to measure the fuse on the CAN bus system. Because it's at the end of the line, there's an open terminal on there, so it's convenient to put your meter on. And if you have power at the last device on the string, clearly you have power on all the devices upstream of that. If you don't, you simply can go down the string and find out where you're losing the power. So once we know we have the proper power on the CAN bus system, then we can go take a look at communication. Proper power is detailed completely into the uh, troubleshooting section. And what you would do is place your meter on the 12 AC1 plug and the ground plug, and you should have between 11 and 13 volts. Go to 12 AC2 to ground, you should also have identical voltage, 12 to 30, 11 to 13 volts. And then if you put your meter between the AC1 and AC2, you should have exactly double that voltage, somewhere between 22 and 26 volts. That means that your CAN bus power is in fact intact. So a way to diagnose the system is the first thing you do is you remove the CAN bus connection from the LMV5 chassis. See the big purple arrow in the middle? I've disconnected all of the servos and all the servo wiring downstream. Well over 98% of the time, any CAN bus disturbance is usually downstream of the LMV AZL and the LMV chassis. It's usually a CAN bus servo or a CAN bus wire. If you do this and you unplug it, I typically expect the AZL to go false feedback air actuator. This is in fact great news. That means that the AZL, the LMV, and the cable, the factory made cable between the LMV and the AZL, those three components are in fact up and working properly. The CAN bus network has been restored and it says, hey, where are my servos? I got a fault feedback on my air actuator. Now we simply have to find out where the problem exists. First thing you do is connect just the cable. See, I've restored the cable back into the LMV5, but all the servos are disconnected. It still says fault feedback air actuator because there's no servos, but it doesn't go into AZL not on bus. If it did, this cable is in fact crossed or damaged, and that's what's causing the CAN bus shutdown. If it didn't cause that, and it still says fault feedback or actuator, the communication is still alive and well, then you simply plug in the first servo and then watch the results, and then plug in the next cable, just the cable, and then the next servo, and the next cable, and the next servo, and by rebuilding this system piece by piece, sooner or later, one of the devices you're gonna plug in and the AZL is gonna to return to AZL not on bus and you will know the cause of the fault. It's a bad cable, it's crossed, it's disconnected, or it's a servo that's been overheated or damaged and the servo is causing the problem. 
That way you can diagnose AZL not on bus can balls. It's a, again, it's fully explained in complete detail in the LMV5 manual. I hope this has give you some comfort in taking the diagnostic codes and the wiring diagrams and the parameter section and using them all together. This completes section 104 troubleshooting. Join us again for future for the VFD, the O2 trim and the PC software. I'll send the uh, presentation back to Aaron and we'll do questions and answer. Thank you.